Thank you, everyone. Welcome to uh, session F. Um, this is, um, I have to dig out my notes for the full um, title, but it's, um, it, it involves uh, voting options, um, the future, sorry, at my age, increasing ways to cast a ballot beyond uh, election day. Um, my name is Doug Chapin. Uh, I am a consultant to the future of California elections. Um, I was involved um, beginning back in 2001 with my friends and colleagues at the Irvine Foundation in getting um, FOCE or FOS set up. Um, so you are welcome or I'm sorry, depending on your point of view. Um, um, but it's an honor to be here uh, again with, uh, um, with my friends and colleagues in the future of California elections. Uh, we have um, what really is um, as close to an all-star cast on this issue as you can possibly get uh, today. So I'm really happy that uh, you're here. Um, just by way of a real quick introduction of this issue, um, I often tell people um, that I am an election geek. Uh, I work with election officials and state legislators and academics uh, and anyone who cares about election administration in this country um, to deal with um, the real high rate of change that we're seeing in election administration um, really uh, specifically since um, the 2000 presidential election and the enactment of the Help America Vote Act, um, but also because of the incredible rate of change in states across the country. Uh, and if you look back over the last 15 years since the 2000 presidential election, um, the biggest change in elections during that time is not the kinds of things that you would think about, like um, voter ID or um, voting technology, but I would suggest it is um, the rapid change in what we now know as, uh, what we used to know as Election Day. Um, in this country, until very recently, and I mean very recently, maybe the last decade, um, the vast, vast majority of Americans voted uh, in what I like to call Norman Rockwell polling places. Um, they were buildings that were geographically close to them, school, church, community center, and the like, staffed with um, their neighbors, some who they knew, maybe some um, who they didn't, um, you know, right down to like the folding table with the printed voter list, you know, the American flag and state flag behind the table, and depending on state law, maybe a crock pot or donuts uh, in um, the corner. Um, and that's how people voted. They voted in a place that was close to their house, and they voted on what we now know as Election Day in federal elections the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Um, the biggest change I would suggest that we've seen since the 2000 presidential election is that the number of people who no longer vote um, in that Norman Rockwell polling place on what we used to know as Election Day um, is growing rapidly. Um, recent studies suggest that nationally as many as four in ten ballots uh, across the country were cast outside of a neighborhood polling place before Election Day. Uh, and in some states, including California, that number can be as high as half uh, or more. Um, obviously, we have a couple of states like Washington State and Oregon, which are all vote by mail. But really, to be honest, across the country um, nowadays, anyone who can't cast a ballot before Election Day outside of a, what I call a Norman Rockwell polling place probably isn't trying. Um, there really aren't many places where there is no option um, to the traditional Election Day polling place uh, model. Um, and that change has created a whole bunch of challenges and opportunities for uh, election administrators and policymakers across the country. And we're really happy to have a panel here today um, to talk about what that means in California and maybe also good ideas uh, from across the country. Um, so what I'll do is I will um, introduce each of our uh, panelists one at a time um, before they get up um, to speak. Um, then we'll have um, a short but incredibly interesting um, Q&A session moderated by yours truly, uh, and then we'll have, um, I hope, an even more inspiring um, Q&A um, with each of you. So um, I will take the lead of um, Melissa Breach, who was up here before me, and say, as you're listening today, um, do think about um, questions you might have um, during Q&A. Uh, um, our first panelist um, is um, Dean Logan, um, Los Angeles County Registrar Recorder. I've known Dean um, um, for a long time um, and in many different capacities. Um, but I will say, um, and this will sound like I'm being funny, but I'm not, um, he's the person who 
really throughout the existence of future of California elections um, has been the person um, who repeatedly and sometimes with physical force has reminded me that we need to think about the future of California uh, elections. Um, that as we get wrapped up in the minutia uh, and um, kind of creeping incrementalism, he's the one who reminds us that we really do need to think big picture about the near foreseeable and distant future of California elections and elections across the country. And Dean is really at the forefront of that thinking um, both at the state level and nationally uh, about the future of California elections. And I know he has some very interesting ideas about what the change in Election Day means for the voting experience, not just when and where people vote, um, but how uh, and uh, where. Dean? Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here and to, to see so many people uh, gathered over the the last couple of days to to look at the future of, of voting in California and, and Doug stole a little bit of my my thunder but I, I do want to emphasize that that for me this this process and this collaborative has been about uh, that that key word in the in the phrase of the banners that you see uh, behind us is the future of California elections and I was reminded of that uh, earlier this week when we had a special screening of the movie Selma if you haven't had a chance to see it there are many poignant moments and messages in that movie that, that pertain to the discussions that are taking place here. But at the point that they're, they're in a, uh, a meeting room and they're talking about what should be in this legislation that ultimately became the, the, the Federal Voting Rights Act, um, that there's this great line that I just wanted to stand up and cheer because they talked about that, that, that we're sitting here talking about 1965 when we should be talking about voting in 1985. And, and I think that's still relevant today. I, I think we still have this, this habit in the, um, in the elections world and, and in the public policy world of looking at elections from a retrospective standpoint, looking at the last election and saying, what, what is it that didn't go the, the way that, uh, that we would have liked it to have gone and how can we fix that incrementally for the next election cycle. Uh, we're still doing that a little bit here in California. The, uh, there's a lot of talk about the, the historical low turnout in the 2014 election and that's a dialogue we should be having and we should be um, working to improve that and, and we had great discussion here about that. But we also should be thinking about not just about the 2016 election but about the 2020 2026 election and beyond to be sure that we're prepared for um, for what's to come and maybe if we do that more proactively uh, we won't see some of these these ebbs and flows uh, in the turnout and the participation rates if we're focusing on the relevancy of elections and the elections process and how the, how those overlay so what I want to talk uh, just briefly um, this morning about is is the approach we've taken in Los Angeles County with our voting systems assessment project Ironically, uh, in Selma, they were talking about elections in 1965. In Los Angeles County, we still run elections the way that we ran them, by and large, in 1968. So, um, so we've moved a little beyond Selma, but, um, but not necessarily. We haven't reached 1985 that they were talking about uh, in the movie, and we're, we're trying to get, to get beyond that. I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but in terms of the equipment and the voting experience, it's still very much the way it was um, in 1968. So we have taken a, a voter-focused approach in LA County to say, okay, we're, we need to replace this legacy system. We need to move forward with a, a more meaningful voting system that serves our jurisdiction. It's a very challenging, very large and diverse jurisdiction. How do we do that? And how do we do that in a way that, that recognizing the behavior patterns and the, uh, the way in which the world that we exist in today works and how fast things change, how can we have a system that can adapt and change to that as well? So we don't invest a lot of money in a new system that, that becomes obsolete in a short period of time. So uh, a lot of that is going to center around this concept of getting beyond elections um, as, as being seen as a single day event between um, this random selection of hours from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. in single locations that are associated with you as an individual voter and into a larger voting period and a larger voting experience where you can customize that experience as a voter, where you can choose within um, some um, realm of uh, parameters, you can choose when, where, and how to cast your ballot in a given, given election. That's what we've learned from the feedback that we've received in our, in our project. Uh, so a little bit uh, about the focus of our, 
our project is improving the voter experience and that focuses on increasing the options for voters, making it a more convenient and meaningful process, and of course making voting more accessible for voters with various range of disabilities or, or other needs. Some of the words that I hear most often when, when, when we talk to voters in LA County um, about their voting experience and why people vote or why they don't vote are people are looking for an experience that's meaningful, they're looking for relevancy so that they, they, so that they see that their vote means something, that it has an impact and that they can actually um, find something tangible to link to that impact. They're looking for something that's familiar, something that's trendy. Last night I, I, I flew home to teach. I teach an MPA class for Cal State Northridge. So I, uh, because I knew I was coming back here this morning, I used them as a focus group. And so I asked them this question about the, the turnout in the November election and about their voting experience and asked them, what are the kind of things that, that, that come to mind to you? And, and it's the same themes that we keep hearing over and over again. I heard about the, the concept of why can't we bring, bring voting to the workplace? Why can't we, we have the option of when I'm on a break or I'm um, on my lunch or when before I go to the, the parking garage to get my car that if I have got my material and I'm ready to cast my vote that I can just go and do that it would be convenient it would be um, it would be meaningful to me to do that why can't we have voting at transit centers where our population is moving um, day in and day out um, during the commuting hours how about at malls or at shopping centers? Uh, and then that, so that, that whole conversation reminded me of a conversation we had at the earlier meeting yesterday about whether this is a systemic problem or a motivational problem. Is it, is it the system that we operate in elections that, that impacts turnout more or is it the motivation behind voting? I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. I also think there are probably two systems at play. There are the election system and then there's the political system. All of those I think have to be addressed uh, in parallel if we're going to address uh, the way people expect to see the voting experience in the future. So a couple of tools that we're working on in the development of our voting system that I think will lead to options. Um, as I was putting this together, I was thinking, I don't know that, that I can stand up here today and, and tell you exactly how this should work in terms of what it should look like. I think it's more about creating a system that has the ability to adapt to those things. And, and I think some of this is going to have to be by trial and error. It's going to have to be through experimentation and getting a lot of feedback from voters. But in order to get to that point, we have to have the tools that will allow us to do that. So some of the things we're looking at in LA County that I think will contribute to that is the idea of an in interactive sample ballot, a process by which uh, the, the voters receive information from us about their, about their ballot, what's going to be on the ballot, and they have the ability to customize that sample ballot um, leading up to the election. They can, uh, they can use it to link to information about candidates and measures. They can uh, use it to pre-mark their selections as they're, as they're uh, getting information. They can use it after the election to track the results of the contests and measures that were most meaningful to them. They can use it to link to social media to, to talk about their voting experience and encourage other people to vote. It's, it's a flexible, customizable option that contributes to a voting experience, but it, it is separate and distinct from the actual official ballot and the act of casting that ballot, which I think is important from a security and integrity standpoint. Um, another component that uh, I think has been talked about already here, but is the idea of an electronic roster or an elect electronic poll book. This is an important tool to, be, to enable us to allow voting in multiple locations and to get away from this one person from the voter to the one polling place uh, concept. It supports remote voting options. It supports the implementation of same day registration, conditional voter registration, and election day registration. Obviously, it uh, reduces printing costs. It, um, it's a more efficient and, and should be, if done correctly, a speedier way to check in voters at a particular voting location. And it also gives us the ability to monitor the activity on election day, to actually put out to the public what's happening on election day. Where are, where are we seeing trends of, of high participation? Where, where can we tell voters on a particular given, given day or time uh, where the lines are the shortest or, or what type of wait time they, they might experience? So a key component to, to that process. Then the actual act of voting, what, we, what we're contemplating in LA County is a vote or a ballot marking device. It's a touchscreen interface that produces a paper ballot of record that's tabulated independent of that ballot marking device. What's key about this um, to this discussion is the design of this is intended to be intuitive and to be familiar and to be compatible with um, assistive technology, with the way people 
uh, interact with other services in, in the public um, sector. It's, it's focused on usability. It's focused on an agile development. So again, as technology improves and as that voting experience changes, this device should be able to change with that as well. It's also intended to be portable, so we, so we can move it to multiple locations depending on um, what we determine uh, that, that pattern is going to look like. And finally, um, and I know this was discussed, I was following the Twitter feed yesterday on my, um, on my flight back to, to LA and again this morning um, back here. Um, and I know there was a lot of discussion yesterday about vote centers. And vote centers, I think, uh, is one of those terms, vote centers can mean many things, but I think the general concept that we're looking at here is moving to an environment where vo voters within a county can go to any of, of many locations. Um, over a period of time when they're ready to cast their ballot, uh, that they can access the correct ballot style, that they can um, interact with that in a, in a way that's, again, more meaningful, flexible, and adaptable to, to their style. Uh, there's a lot involved in that um, that I'm sure uh, my, my colleague from Colorado is going to talk about, that, that they've had experience with that, and I know you had discussion about it yesterday. I think this is probably the, the key point that we need to make the, the move earliest on in California in order to enable a more meaningful and flexible voting experience. So I will cut off there and pick up at Q&A. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. So in my work, I have um, lots of opportunities to talk to reporters from across the country. And inevitably, they call with a jurisdiction-specific question or they want to talk about a given issue. but. Um, they always end every call with the same question, and I'm, they must teach it at journalism school. It's, is there anything else I should know that I didn't ask you about? Um, and my current favorite answer is you need to see and look at what's happening in Colorado. Uh, there's always one state across the country where it's kind of all happening. Uh, the, you know, the it state, I like to call it. Um, immediately after 2000, um, it was Florida. Um, for a while, it was Ohio, not just because of the politics. But right now, I think it's Colorado. Um, and I had the opportunity to see um, our next presenter, uh, Amber McReynolds from Denver, Colorado, at a gathering in Texas of legislative officials um, uh, late last year. Um, and I've seen a lot of stuff in this business. And what she talked about is going on in Colorado um, knocked my socks off. Um, and I really do think is a huge change in the way we think about election day and voting across the country. Um, I always do a really lousy job of explaining um, how um, Colorado works and I always en end up sending the reporters um, to Amber. Um, so that's me and I'm sorry. Um, but I'm delighted that we'll have her here today to give it to you um, straight from the source. Um, there's a lot of exciting things going on in Denver, Colorado and to tell you about it, Amber McReynolds, thank you. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here to speak in, in California. Uh, I've never been to Sacramento, so this is the first time I've, I've been here, but you guys have a, a beautiful state and uh, very excited to, to see this conference and sort of talking about the future of, of elections in California uh, and excited to be here to share what Colorado has done over the past few years and, and what, we're, what we're sort of doing in 2015 and 2016 as well. Uh, when talking about the future of, of elections, um, I have a, an interesting uh, perspective when I go home at night, um, and I totally agree with what Dean and, and Doug have said about looking at it for down the road and not just sort of the, you know, resolving the issues that might be facing us today, but looking at really a long-term strategy. Um, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old at home. And, you know, when I go home or, you know, think about what I've done in a, a given day, I always go back to what their voting experience might look like when they, um, when they actually start voting someday. Uh, and I also have to say, I have a little bit of a cold, so I apologize for kind of the, the nasal, <laughs> the nasally presentation. 
Uh, but I was asked today to talk about sort of Colorado's model, and we did a, a modernized election bill in 2013. Uh, right at the end of 2012, after the presidential election, I was approached by some, a group of legislators as well as voting activists. Uh, and also other other uh, interested parties in the election process, and we started having meetings uh, every week f for the sort of first few weeks, and then it started to be every other day um, as we got closer to actually filing the bill. But they said, you know, we want to look at same day registration, and what else would you? What else do you want to talk about? So we we started talking about sort of same day. We started talking about mail ballots. We kind of started talking about all the issues that. Um, that face the voter and how we could how we could improve on them. Uh, so I was I was part of that legislative process and helped write um, a lot of the the bill that ultimately became 1303. Uh, and so I can definitely give you the perspective from there as well as the perspective as an election administrator that actually implemented the new law once we once we had it. Uh, so why there was a couple things that we were looking at specifically when we decided to rewrite. Uh, election legislation in Colorado. Uh, Colorado had a high provisional ballot percentage, so um, hi high number of provisionals being cast, but also a high number of provisionals being counted. So Colorado was over a 90 percent acceptance rate for provisionals in the 2012 election. And what didn't make sense is why are we doing, why are we spending all this money and all these resources processing a ballot as a provisional when it could have been a normal ballot. Uh, high percentage of permanent vote by mail. So in 2008, uh, there was a bill passed that put in place permanent vote by mail in Colorado, and as we got, as we sort of moved through the uh, years after that, um, permanent mail and voting became more and more popular. And the only elections where we were conducting sort of the polling place early voting, some counties were doing vote centers and and mail ballots was the largest. So in between all of the you know midterm, uh, um, off year, odd year elections as well as municipals were all being conducted by mail, along with the primary. So we were getting a lot of very confused voters throughout the uh, election process about, you know, they would call and say, why didn't I get a mail ballot? I got one in the last election. And there was sort of this request process that was becoming very, very confusing. And finally, it's all about the data. So looking at provisionals, looking at registration numbers, and, and looking at the data that the voters tell us they want, whether it's calls that come into the office about confusion or statistics related to turnout. It was sort of all about the data when we started to talk about changing the policy. So the policy innovation, the new model in Colorado has a few key elements. First, it's ballot delivery. So right now, and I, and I very specifically say ballot delivery when describing this. Right now, ballots are being delivered through the post office. And for military and overseas voters, they, all, they also have an option of getting their ballot securely linked to them via email. So they get a secure link, they can access their ballot online and return it. Um, so ballot delivery right now through the post office, and again, down, down the road in the future, maybe it's more like what UOCAVA voters experience, where a voter can access their ballot any time that they want leading up to the election, download it, and return it to us in one of the various ways. Um, also, proactive list maintenance. Because we were going to be delivering ballots to all voters by mail, we wanted to make sure the address library was as clean as possible. So we implemented proactive list maintenance. So if, you're, if you fill out a change of address at the post office in Colorado, we used to just send you a letter and ask you to update your address. Now we actually can update your record if you're within the same county, or we send you a notification if you're outside of the county. So in Denver alone, we updated over 50,000 records in 2014 as a result of using national change of address data. So that saved us a significant amount of money on return mail, return ballots, and not having to sort of process paper forms as they came in because it was an electronic transfer of data from the post office. We also, as part of the legislation, wanted to preserve in-person options. So Colorado's model is not Oregon. It's also not Washington. It very much is ballot delivery, and then we um, created what we call voter service and polling centers based on formulas. So all the counties are uh, have to apply the formula um, based on a per vo voter registration count and then allocate voter service and polling centers that any voter can go to within the within the jurisdiction. 
And all of these voter service and polling centers are connected to the statewide voter registration database. So it's real time. We record voting history, whether it's a mail ballot in the main office or it's an in-person vote at the voter service and polling centers uh, immediately, and you can easily tell that. And we can also poll, pe poll voters from other counties if they move, um, so we can do all of that. And then voter registration modernization. And that uh, gave us same day registration. So we now can register voters all the way up to and on election day. And that, is a, that has been a huge element in our new process. For the voter registration modernization piece, uh, the key element, we eliminated the 30 day precinct requirement. So in Colorado previously, we had a 30 day, you had to live in your precinct for 30 days. So we were having a high number of provisional ballots because voters don't check and see when there's an election coming up before they decide they're going to move. And we opted for a 22-day state residency requirement. I attribute a lot of our reduction that you'll see on the next slide in provisionals to this, this simple policy change here. So registration can now happen all the way up to and on election day. And in Colorado, as you may know, we're very much a swing state. You can see the numbers. 36% of Coloradans are unaffiliated. 31% are Democrats and 32% are, are Republicans. So it's very much a swing state. The majority of Coloradans are unaffiliated, not affiliated with either, either major party. And um, so we have kind of a, a very diverse uh, state in that way. Provisional ballots, this is, this is probably the biggest success story as it relates to the new Colorado model. We saw a 98% reduction in provisional ballots in 2014. So in 2012, as a state, Colorado had over 65,000 provisional ballots. There were 980 statewide in 2014. Based on the, number, the voter turnout, we should have had about 45,000. Uh, so we, we saw 980 total statewide, which is significant. So it's 0.04% of the total number of votes cast. In Denver, um, we saw a similar experience. Sorry. Um, we saw a similar experience in Denver. We only had 178 across the entire county. And then the voter experience. So I mentioned hotline calls. We're also tracking data as it relates to why voters contact our office. And we saw a significant reduction in the reasons that they had to call us. They didn't have to get, they didn't have to call us about the 30 day precinct requirement or missing the registration deadline. All of that was resolved through the new policy. And it's much easier for us to communicate how to address those issues with the voters. And then finally, new registrations by age demographics. So this is within 30 days of the election. Uh, and 57% of 18 to 30-year-olds utilize same-day registration within 30 days of the election. So by far the bulk of the people that utilized the new law were within that 18 to 30-year-old age demographic. Uh, those that are under 18, Colorado does have the pre-registrant at 16, so we actually saw a little over 3,400 16-year-olds register within 30 days. Um, and then there's also a breakdown across the other, the other age categories there as well. And for turnout, for Colorado, we saw the highest turnout in a midterm election in Colorado's history. Uh, and we were one of the only states where we actually saw an increase in turnout as opposed to a decrease where most people saw um, uh, in the rest of the country. And statewide, we, we saw a, a, an increase in turnout. Colorado still saw the majority of voters use their mail ballot. So 95% of voters did use their mail ballot. But of that 90, 95%, 73% of them actually dropped off their ballot in person. So they actually used one of our 20, we have 24-hour boxes located all across the counties. Um, and you can drop your ballot off in any of those anytime. So the majority of, of voters definitely selected and opted for an in-person drop off as opposed to mailing it back to the post office, which is also significant. Um, and then there's, there's still room for improvement, obviously. And one of the things that we're really looking at now is of the in-person voters that happened, so of that 5%, 73% of that happened on election day. So while a lot of people utilize the mail ballot, we still wanted to preserve those in-person options and give people a chance to come in on election day and take care of all of their voting needs, including registration. And so we saw definitely the bulk again on election day itself. Um, and then finally, on the efficiencies and, and cost savings. So final numbers are still being calculated, but significant savings in provisional ballots. 
it's looking like now, based on the survey of counties, there's about a 15% cost reduction from the last midterm gubernatorial election and about a 35% decrease in cost from a presidential. We know that that's probably not going to hold when it comes around for the next presidential, but those have been the, the cost savings so far. And that's enabled counties like ours to do various innovations for voters that we are, um, that we've implemented and are, that are supporting this new model. One of them is Ballot Trace. Um, if you haven't heard about that, that's our ballot tracking, reporting, and communication engine. So our voters can opt in, and this is in Denver specifically along with a few other counties, but they can opt in and get text notifications about the status of their mail ballot. They can see when, once it was sent into the counting room and once it was verified, they get notified if it was undeliverable or if it has any signature discrepancies. So it's a proactive tool. Voters don't need to call us to get that information. We just put that out there. We also were able to implement some new equipment internally with some of the cost savings that we've done. Um, and we've realized significant efficiencies with, with some of that as well. Um, procedural efficiencies as well as implementing a laser tab remover, so the privacy tab that covers your signature on your mail ballot. We now have, and it's the first one in the country, but we worked with the vendor to design it. It lasers out the tab and pulls it out and removes that. We used to have to do all that manually. So we gained a lot of efficiencies that way as well. And then our Denver Votes mobile app, I know there was talk of the of VIP project and we did a, a, similar, a similar thing for Denver specifically. We've got sample ballots, contact information for elected officials, all of that, and we were able to also do that with some of our savings in the past year. And then most recently, um, within the last two weeks, we rolled out what we call Denver eSign, and that's a digital petition application. So our municipal candidates right now are circulating petitions in Denver, utilizing an iPad, they're signing, uh, voters are signing, and actually ver it verifies that they're in the correct district. And we've rolled that out with savings that we generated in 2014. So giving the voter, as well as the um, candidates and campaigns, more access to the actual ballot. And then finally, I know there's been talk of this, uh, and I believe Secretary Padilla is going to come to Denver in May. Uh, we, we are implementing a new voting system, and it, we did a mock election on it a couple weeks ago. It will be in, um, in the works for our May municipal election. It uses full off-the-shelf um, equipment, so scanners for tabulation, and then it has a tablet-based tablet kiosk for voters when they vote in person, and it all ties in as well with UACAVA and online um, tra uh, sending out of the ballots to military and overseas voters. So those are sort of the elements, that's what's coming, and again, we've been able to fund a lot of that from savings that we experienced in 2014 with the new model. So I'm over and I'm done. <laughs> so thank you very much. Did I lie? All right. So um, next up um, is Mindy Romero um, from UC Davis. Um, one of my favorite Mark Twain quotes um, is that supposing is good, but finding out is better. Uh, and Mindy has played that role for FOS uh, in a variety of ways. Um, Mindy has been on the forefront of our effort to study the impact of um, things like vote by mail on different populations within California, but also to think about what that means um, down the line. And so when you hear about the kinds of innovations that Dean and Amber are talking about, Mindy has really grounded us in what that means for different um, communities across the state. And I know she's going to talk about uh, a lot of that today. Mindy? Good morning. Everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. <laughs> great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. So um, I am just going to jump on in. So as Doug said, we have been doing a lot of work around understanding vote by mail ballots in the state of California. And let's go here. So there we go. I needed to see my screen. Um, so there are three uh, publications that we have released over the last year. Uh, working with, it's a collaboration uh, with, of course, the Future of California Elections. All three of these here are listed in your resources page of your agenda booklet. So you have our conference booklet. So you have those uh, along with the online links that you can go directly to and look up, look up these um, pieces of research. So today I'm going to be highlighting 
taking highlights from them. And if you don't want to go to them directly for some reason or you want um, to check out our website, they're also available on our website at regionalchange.ucdavis.edu and CCEP stands for the California Civic Engagement Project. Okay, so for today, highlighting some key elements of those three pieces of research, we identified the uh, demographic composition of vote-by-mail voters in California, and specifically we focused on the 2012 general election, being the first general election, of, as I'm sure all of you know by now, where the participation or the proportion of all votes cast were, was above 50%, just above 50%. Uh, the breakdown of reasons for ballot rejection. So those folks that don't get their, they actually intend to cast their ballot, vote by mail, and that, that ballot ends up being rejected and not counted. Why is that? And the, demo, the demographic composition specifically of those unsuccessful vote by mail voters. So there was a question of, well, of those that get their ballot rejected, are some groups more disproportionately impacted than others in that rejection process? Okay, so looking at demographic composition. So we did find some of the, as Doug alluded to, the the, the thinking we know and now knowing, right, in terms of being able to look at hard data. So different subgroups do use vote by mail in California at different rates. So for that 2012 general election, um, youth voters, and we define them for this piece of research at 18 to 23, so they had the lowest vote by mail use rates, uh, race, rates if I can say it, of any age group in California for that election, only about 39%. And that means of all of their ballots cast, <laughs> only 39% were cast vote by mail. Does that make sense? Whether they actually went through the mail or whether they were dropped off, but it was a vote by mail ballot. So a lower rate than the, than the statewide total. By race and ethnicity, Latinos at, at of, of the groups that we studied had the lowest um, use rate, only 37%, and Asian Americans at 58%, so they were above the state number. So composition. So we know different groups use, and use vote by mail at different rates, but what does the the pie of vote by mail voters look like if we take, instead of looking at the total of all voters, let's look at the populations of vote by mail voters versus poll voters. Do, do those two populations look different? So, and I've um, reported on this in more depth just last year at the FOCH conference back in March. So I'm just touching on these here and again, direct you to the, to the published research and then we'll move on to the other pieces of data. Um, so breakdown of vote by mail ballots as a, as again, a pie of voters, right, it's a population. VBM voters are older, so the greater proportion of VBM voters are older. Um, less Latino, more Asian American, less Democratic, being registered uh, Democratic, and there's different regional patterns. So moving on to reasons for ballot rejection. So first off, I just wanna direct you, so there was a lot of talk in 2012 and coming out of that general election, not only of the first time reaching 50% of, of, of use, but there was also talk of the rejection rate, right? So we had a one uh, out of all vote by mail ballots, about 1% of them were rejected. It was about 69,000 actual ballots and concerning to many folks and wanting to know again, well, what's going on with these ballots? But if you look historically, we can go back to 2010 in terms of consistent data that's been reported. You can see that the rejection rates have actually been much higher. That was actually a low point. And then just in the 2014 primary in June, we had uh, 2.9 percent rejection rate and it was over 90,000 90, or so ballots that ended up being rejected in a much lower turnout election. Um, and we're waiting for the 2014 general election rejection rates. Oops. Okay, so in terms of um, reasons for rejections, again in 2012, and of course SB um, 29 has been instituted and we can talk about that maybe in the Q&A or it's being implemented. Um, we can see that late takes up a very large proportion, almost 50% of all those ballots that are rejected. But still, no signature or bad signature. Bad signature just means that's a non-match. Right? And then let's look at the breakout by groups, by demographics. And specifically for, oops, if I can go back. For this report, we looked at age, language preference, and military status. We will be producing or releasing a final report just next month. And in that final report, we'll be extending the analysis of these three briefs that I highlight today, um, and we'll be extending the analysis for uh, additional demographic groups, race and ethnicity and others, and we'll also be touching on 2014 since we now have some 2014 data to do that with as well. Uh, but today, age, language preference, and military status. So youth are more likely to experience VBM rejection, having their ballots rejected. So a very large proportion, if you can see in the back, the blue bars are rejected ballots, red is all voters. So almost 
20, about 23% of all youth VBM ballots were rejected. It's a huge number. Or excuse me, all VBM ballots, period, were rejected, um, were youth. And you can see as you go up in age, you can, it crosses. So older voters make up a smaller pr proportion of rejected VBM ballots, if that, that makes sense, if I still have you. So youth made up 23% of all rejected ballots in the state of California in the 2012 general election. So why is that if we, and this is a more complicated graph, so again, the blue, if you can see, is late, though the reason being late. Um, the red is signature non-match, the green is no signature at all, and others various reasons combined. So rejected youth VBM ballots, why are, they, why are there so many that are rejected? In 2012, it was because they were late, so you can see nearly about 65, 66% were rejected because they were late. And for older voters, you follow the green bars, you see them increasing. Older voters, more of their ballots were rejected because of signature issues. Yeah, no signature. I see some nodding heads here. Okay. Um, and I'll talk at the end here why this is important to have the, these, folks, these um, breakdowns. And then briefly here in terms of um, additional disparities in vote-by-mail rejection, non-English language ballots were more likely to be rejected. Missing signature was a major reason for rejection of non-English ballots. It wasn't because of late, it was because of missing signature. And military and overseas ballots were more likely to be rejected. And if you're wondering why, it was because of, of lateness. Um, but there's some differentiations there that we talk about in the report. So why, um, why does this all matter? Why do we need to know? Why do we need some hard data? Well, there are impacts from these, right? So there, today we're talking about voter options. We know that there's been, for the last few years, and I think now more than ever, a lot of discussion around um, all vote by mail in California, expanding it, or potentially even going all vote by mail altogether, if you will, in California. But we haven't had a whole lot of data to tell us what the difference is in these populations and to maybe point to any potential disparate impacts if we do um, limit polling options or, or eliminate polling options. Thank you. So by understanding who's participating using vote by mail, who isn't, what groups aren't, by understanding what groups are impacted in terms of rejection and what groups are having more issues, like older voters having more issues with, with um, no signature. And I point to you because you were nodding <laughs> earlier. Um, so outreach and education, right? These data inform outreach and education services to vote by mail voters, particularly around language access. Um, and as some counties look to possibly reduce their polling places, we need to understand disparate impact. And we also know that some of these um, reasons for rejections or, or rates of rejection vary across counties as well. And it's critical to policy decisions. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mindy. Um, and last and absolutely not least, um, we have Carla Zambro from California Calls, who you heard from in the morning plenary. Um, we talk a lot about the need to meet voters where they are um, in the work that we do. Um, and I think often we do that figuratively. We need to sort of meet them in whatever situation they have. What I like about the work that Carla and her team does is that they literally meet voters where they are, on the street, at their door, um, on the phone. Uh, they reach out uh, and, um, and, and contact voters um, to support the work they do, but also, I think, to support um, the, the state system of democracy. And so um, the reason we invited Carla to be a part of this panel is because I, she as well, or if not better than anyone, understands what the changing concept of Election Day looks like to people on the ground in communities, especially in communities that don't necessarily participate at the same rate uh, as others. Uh, and so with um, the voters I view and probably a triple espresso shot of energy to this panel for, uh, she's a quad, um, um, Carla Zambra. Yeah, my college education was funded by my barista jobs. So, yeah, I'm so starstruck, stuck, starstruck, because Dean Logan, like, you're, like, on my ballot every time. <laughs> this is my registrar, you guys. You got a big job, and I don't make it a lot easier, because I turn my ballot in on election day every time. And I was told by another registrar, I think it was Santa Cruz, like, oh, my God, it's such a pain when you people do that. 
sorry. Um, so I talked a little bit about who California Calls is. I won't go through that again. But you know, again, the the folks that we the core of our work is is in large um, urban areas as well as rural areas, very heavily in low income communities. So we're in these itty bitty towns like Weed Patch, is the coolest place to do a precinct walk ever. <laughs> and I got to go with Dolores Huerta herself too, down to South LA and. Um, Part of our policy agenda, though, has always been about expanding democracy. Uh, we were involved in the ballot initiative reform project. A lot of folks in this room were involved in that. Um, we've been at the table for a lot of pushes to expand ex-incarcerated voting rights. So many people don't even know they can vote. And by the way, the county jails are filled with people there on a misdemeanor who can still vote. Um, and also with ACA, um, as, as Obamacare was getting implemented, part of it was supposed to be about registering to people to vote when they do that. And frankly, because I can say this, there's an agenda at work when we set those policies up or we make it legal for ex-offenders to, to vote, yet we don't actually set that up for success. And it is, it is unfortunately really political because the people who are disenfranchised, who aren't um, who aren't participating are the people that are not benefiting from the process and who, when they vote, are going to make some changes happen. At least that's what we hope, which is why we organize them. Um, you know, we, um, I was saying earlier about how we, we should act like voting is super duper important. We think it is, and it really is, but we don't treat it that way as, as a government, as a people, because we don't put the money into it. Um, first of all, because we have some rad ideas. We actually think it would be great if we did, like I was mentioning earlier, send higher community organizers all over the state to go turn people out. We had a bunch of people in the room talking about wanting to get more into GOTV work. Um, let's do it. Um, so, you know, things like same-day voter registration are, are really, really going to help a lot. And, and some of the, thing, the points that Mindy was raising about vote by mail are helping a lot. And, I, oh my God, it would be so cool if our voting system looked like what you have in Colorado right now. So there's some great ideas happening. You know, part of it, though, is having the political will, and part of it also is, is investing in it the way we invest in other things that our government thinks are important. And it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. If we vote and if we push these policies, then, then they can happen. But the reality is a big barrier to the accessibility of voting is just you know, people's own cynicism from, not, from living in such abject poverty and with such difficulty that they stop. It's just that disillusionment. And, and you can fix the system and make it more accessible, but there's another part of it that's about just having that conversation and having people really understand um, how important their vote is. The work that we do, like I said, we call and call and call. <laughs> we knock on doors all over the place. We develop materials that are accessible and messages that we know resonate with people. We tried some stuff out. We actually did, um, we partnered with SEIU and in the Central Valley we did a voter registration and vote by mail conversion um, project. And it's, it's kind of more anecdotal because it's not something we sustained over time. We found, as many of you probably know, that trying to do a voter registration drive is oh my god, it's such a pain. It's like you go door to door and it's like, oh no, we're already registered. Okay, next door. Oh no, we're already registered. Oh, he's not, but he's not here. Um, but what we did was we coupled it with the people that were home. We said, well, are you registered to vote by mail? Because it can be a lot easier to vote um, if, if you can vote by mail. And we explained it. And, and folks thought that that would actually not be very successful. About 80%, I'm not kidding, 80% of the people that we asked to register to vote by mail signed up to be a permanent absentee voter. Again, this was, this was a, a small test um, that we did a couple of years ago. But um, while we, we know and we hear Latinos, um, young folks, are cynical about mailing in a ballot or for whatever the reasons are, aren't registered to vote by mail, if you have someone from the community at their door talking to them about it, um, that actually changes. Another thing um, is that we found we do a lot of work to increase turnout. A couple, actually only three times in our 13 pro statewide programs did we work on a ballot initiative. But hot issue or not, uh, we've, we increase turnout. Um, the people that we talk to turn out as much as 16% higher, including in LA. We had low turnout this time, but our folks turned out 47% compared to 31% which we're all working on, um, but, the, but, but clearly the, the actual outreach and door-to-door -door really works. Um, so in terms of um, 
Making voting more accessible and solutions to that, um, I think we have some great experts here and we have some great case studies that, that we should do. And I'm not going to pretend to be the expert on the nuances and the weeds of that. But one thing I'll say is that there are community organizations like the 31 organizations smeared all over the state that we work with as well as a whole bunch of others who probably have some good ideas and maybe can do some beta testing of this stuff and, and, and have a vested interest in changing the dynamics of who's making decisions and who's not every election cycle. And so work with those groups to come up with the ideas because there's a lot of folks like me that are like fantasy world in my head we would have same day voter registration and then I was like oh my god we're gonna have that um, so we have a lot of good ideas just no one's asking us very much and um, implementing these ideas can also be a lot successful I know a few many years ago I don't remember when it was but they tried out early voting at specific places and and that was part of an effort I think it was way back in 04 do you remember Dean yeah, and, and it was, and, and some people voted early, but it was like not really set up for complete success by having people really organizing around it. Again, that means ads, it means bus ads, it means, you know, really getting the word out. We have a lot of great ideas, so let's also invest in, in setting them up for success. Um, and also that, that when we think about making it more success, accessible, let's zero in on the people who currently aren't participating um, and really think about what would make it more accessible for them. And again, we have a lot of good ideas. Part of it is the, is the political will and it's the money. And that's it. Cut and short again. Thank you very much. Um, and so now um, I'm going to take just a few minutes uh, and um, pose some questions to our panel. And then I will encourage all of you to think about um, even more probing and interesting questions for them. Um, I want to start um, with a question um, to Amber. I wonder, obviously, there's a lot going on in Colorado, and you've had a high degree of change. To what extent did you benefit from pre existing experience with things like? vote centers in some Colorado communities. Now, do, you, do you think that Colorado had a head start with that sort of experience? Or can other states that haven't had that experience kind of jump right into the full Colorado ballot delivery model? There you go. Um, I think that there, there were some counties that had done vote centers, so we, we did create um, what's, what, what we called a best practices group and sort of technical subcommittee of the commission that we, basically the law authorized a commission that would sort of help with implementation, advise uh, the Secretary of State's office in particular on implementing the new law. And it included voting activists as well as legislators as well as election administrators. And so that commission really spent a lot of time uh, looking at sort of what the plans would be for this and we leveraged a lot of the experiences that the vote center counties ha had with you know whether it was technical setup or network setup or whatever it might be uh, so there was a lot of discussion about that it also gave us an opportunity to sort of sit down and map out the business process that would occur at the voter service and polling centers and all counties implemented the same sort of business process on how we were processing voters so the experience looked very similar if you were in a voter service and polling center in one county versus one across the state. Um, and then I guess on kind of on that similar vein, Dean, I, I, we do know that there was some limited experience with, with some innovations back in um, um, the early 2000s. Um, what's your take on what other than the need for imagination um, needs to happen for these kinds of options to be widely available? What, you know, what, what sort of um, as Amber says, business process or other changes need to occur or would you like to see occur for California to evolve beyond its current reliance mostly on polling place and vote by mail voting? Yeah, so I would say a few things about that. I think that um, I think similar to the the voter behavior that we're seeing is is changing and evolving and the fact that we need to pay attention to that we need to we need to develop a a regulatory framework that allows us to to have the flexibility to to try some of these things and adapt to them um, much the way uh, and and i think i think colorado has has given us a good example for that but we also have to i think be cautious in doing that in that that um 
not every community is is the same as as the community next door or um, in, in a different region of the state. So there needs to be the ability to to um, allow for those things to evolve, to to see if they have voter um, acceptance, and to to see what works and to to build on that. So I think some some level of piloting, um, and we have some ability to do that under uh, the provisions of Senate Bill 360 that was passed. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I think uh, the other thing is to is to really dig into these experiences. I think we should look closely at what's happening in Colorado to, and and look at that through the eyes of the the data that, that Mindy's presented um, and and talk about. So how can we use both the the data that's been gathered as well as the experience in another jurisdiction and 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 merge those those things? Um, I think it's it's something that that. The, the one caution I would, that I would put out there, and, and I think history has shown, that, that we're slow to make changes in the elections process, but when we make them, we make them really fast and we make them really boldly, and I'm not sure that's the right approach. I think, I think we need to allow to be sure that we do it correctly. So you referenced early voting in California, which was a successful model. It was uh, used in LA County for, for several years. It became an option that voters were used to. It wasn't a huge number of voters. I think we had about 60,000 voters um, in, on average in a statewide election, but when you take an option like that away, which we ended up doing in 2008, there's a ramification to that. And so we need to be sure that whatever we're putting in place, that we're going to be able to sustain that. And if we're going to invest in educating and promoting that with our voters, that we're going to be able to sustain it over time. Thank you. And, and speaking of the data, um, Mindy, I know you and I um, had an exchange. There was a, a, an article recently in the National Press, in the Washington Post, about the turnout curve by age. Uh, about how um, basically uh, turnout goes up as a voter's age goes up, that younger voters tend to turn out at a much lower rate than um, older voters. And I know there was a little bit of inaccuracy in that because of what was involved, but still the shape of the line was, was pretty striking, that it's almost a linear relationship. Do you have any sense of how different either demographic groups, age, what have you, view different voting options? Do we get a sense of, you know, will these, the disparities you saw with regard to different um, ethno-racial groups using vote by mail, do we get the sense that that will further persist if we go to even more modes of voting like vote centers or the full Colorado model? Okay. And I realize we're a little out past the data, but you've yeah. been marinating in the data for a while, so a while. Um, I give you free reign to do some supposing. Oh, well, that's a dangerous thing for a researcher. Um, well, I think first, first of all, if I may, just on the vote by mail uh, to explain some of the lower numbers, and I think this is instructive or helpful to then be, go beyond it. Um, so, why do youth um, use vote by mail at lower percentages, right, than other groups? And, and I'm sure all of you could speak to this here as well. But um, th there's lots of reasons, but a lot of it has to do with mobility, um, and. Um, and, and socioeconomic status, so being renters and ha having it be tied to an address. But also I think that it's, um, it's about, um, I think for many, the idea of mailing something, for many of us, period, but for, for the younger generation, it's an antiquated thing, you know. Um, I, uh, I was giving a, a presentation about this a while back, and in the casual q and I made a, com a, a comment about my own children, and I said my my, I did, luckily didn't say which gender, which child, but I said one of my own kids was, didn't know where to find a, a postage stamp. Uh, and it was written up in the local paper and he didn't, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, he or she. <laughs> he or she didn't appreciate that very much. I mean, who would, have, <laughs> who would have thought? It was a fantastic article and lots and lots of data and front page, I think, and everything else. But who would have thought that the writer would have put an anecdote, a personal anecdote in there. So I had, you know, friends calling me and my children's friends calling me. Um, so anyway, but that is to make a memorable point um, that it's a, it, the idea of mailing something, right, is, is I think um, very odd. Um, and I think as, as, and another note to that is, as this younger generation who are na very native to electronics and not native to mailing something, as they become the, the next age group, and then the next age group, and the next age group. That will, we'll have to think about, um, if we're expanding vote by mail, what does that mean 
for the for future right um, future voters. Um, I think beyond that, I think um, I think your question was just other types of options, period, voting centers, all that sort of thing. I think we know that in general, voting options are great for folks that are not as familiar with the, the electoral process, so for youth. Um, if they feel like they have options that are relevant to their lives and it makes sense to their lives, so if, if it's a voting center that is close to where they recreate or where they go to school or where they work, those things I think are, are highly relevant. But in terms of specific data about how, how some of those options are viewed, that's kind of hard to come by. But um, the more options, the better, I think, for young people, period. But a kicker with that is that, and I, this was brought up earlier, you have to let folks know about those options. And I think for young people even more so, who are not familiar, they're entering into the process and who are not familiar, right? Um, you have to tell them what those options are. You have to tell them why they're important, why they're helpful. Um, uh, outreach to them, connect with them. Otherwise, you create options that, if they're not using them, then it looks like on paper, on data, that, oh, that's not something that they're interested in, or they're, but maybe there's barriers to that, or they're just not even fully aware of it. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question somewhat? I think so, and I guess, I guess the, to, to sort of be an active listener, so it, is it, is it safe to say that as options pro proliferate, we should expect that there will continue to be disparities, demographic, ethno-racial, ethno geographic? We shouldn't expect that all voters will turn out in the same proportion to all the different modes of voting. We should expect and be ready to address different communities disparate use of different modes of voting, vote by mail, vote centers, in person, I, I think that you. if we took, if we, if we, I don't want to say assumptions, but if we had that in mind going forward, that's a much safer bet than the other way around. So when you're talking particularly with historically underrepresented groups, um, options help, but they're not the only thing, and contact is really first and foremost the most important thing, contact and education and information. So as you as you change the, the playing field and you give more options, you still have to worry about the fact that they are disconnected, feel disconnected from the political process. They're not as aware, they're not outreach to, right? They're not mobilized. And so you add options, that's a great thing, but you have to bring everything else along with it. Otherwise, then yes, well, that in and of itself wouldn't necessarily, you would still expect um, disparities in use and participation and awareness and, and all that sort of thing. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and then Carla, uh, and obviously um, you're out talking to lots of people and my grandfather was very fond of saying that you can learn a lot by asking. Um, and um, given the high degree of contact you and your colleagues have with voters, um, I know this isn't the reason why you go out and contact them, but do you get any feedback from them about, you know, why don't we this or I wish we did that? Um, or is it very, is it pretty much just the way we hope you turn out? Do you, do you have sort of insight from these contacts from people in the field about um, what they think, how they think voting should work, and what would work better for them? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I know Dean gets his own microphone, and we have to share over yeah, here. <laughs> they don't call him Hollywood Dean Logan. <laughs> no, they don't. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm so going to use that. <laughs> and a meme is born. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the conversation that we have with folks is helping them, okay, here's how to do it, right? So go, go find that ballot, okay, this is how you do it, make sure you sign it, right? And so I think that's a good question for us to ask. But what, what we, do, we do hear from is the folks that are doing the door-to-door -door and, and them, you know, as well as the organizations. And, and I, mean, I think the punchline is like, why do we make it so damn hard? <laughs> You know, um, and so there's a lot of ideas like, could we vote online, or or could we like have early voting and and lots of it, and and actually like if if we had it again, like that'd be the type of thing that those of us that do voter outreach would love to have that be part of our program. And actually, we did, I think in '04, that was that was part of the strategy was just getting people to the polls early in that election. But again, it was it's. We did it that one time, and it's not been like a sustained uh, part of it. So, I, I actually think that the these are the experts here, and um, and and I haven't heard ideas different from that. the The key thing is, what are the options? How do people do it? So we can go out and help get them using all those options. You know, and and definitely, like I said, um, 
it's totally true. Young folks are like, I ain't answering the home phone. Voting by mail is totally weird. And there's, there's other, like, by, by culture, by immigration status, other factors for why people vote a certain way, oops, or not. Um, and, and I think that um, tied to what Mindy was saying a second ago, it, let's pull those folks together and focus in and deliberately ask that question, right? What, what would make voting more um, accessible? And, and then come up with the best ideas and test them out. Totally agree. Take a huge investment, and I don't want to set something up to fail, so let's, let's test it out, but let's make a decision that voting is super duper important and, and, and do it. Great. Thank you. I, um, I will tell a story on one of my own children. Um, I was with my um, um, non-gender specific, no, I was with my son. Um, at the grocery store and picking up a couple of things, and I remembered I needed postage stamps, um, and and I must have just said, "I'll let." Oh, I f I forgot how great it is to be able to buy postage stamps at the grocery store. And he looked at me like a you know a teenager can and was like, "Yeah." Um, so I think to him the notion that one you would need a postage stamp and two that you would be excited that they sell them at the grocery store <laughs> meant that I was older than dirt. Um, so um, I, I can, um, um, as my same grandfather used to say, I can smell what you're stepping in, um, Carla. Um, great. So let me um, throw it out um, to the group. Um, I've got, um, I see, I see, I see Kathy Fung, and then Deanna in the back. And then I've got you next, sir, and I've got Ryan next. So one, two, oh, five, sorry, six. You're an, you're an inquisitive bunch. Got another one over here. All right, I got, all right, so I had, who did I say for? I said Kathy first. This question is not for Hollywood Dean Logan. Um, actually, uh, so Amber, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned a little bit about um, creating a formula for identifying how and where to place satellite sites or vote centers, I should say. We call them satellite sites because of quibbling in California. Anyways, but that would be very useful for you to talk through what that formula is and then how that's helped you to identify certain sites because uh, this is a conversation that we're going on, we're, we're having right now as we think about implementation of our own conditional voter registration. Um, and then, Mindy, if I could ask you, you said that Latinos have a much higher um, or a much lower use of vote by mail. And I'm wondering if you've dug a little deeper to figure out um, why that is um, and whether that's about um, failure of campaigns to do outreach? Is it about um, cultural differences or traditional differences? Um, so the formula, the way that our law is, is written in Colorado is that there's a formula for the early voting period. So we actually open up voter service and polling centers for, depending on the type of election, for a general election, they're open a little over two weeks prior to the actual election day. And the formula for that is one per 30,000. Uh, registered active voters in in the jurisdiction so as an example the way that that turned out for us in Denver that that we we needed 12 we had 13 um, and then in the law there's also um, provisions for the two Saturdays so the sites are all open on two for two Saturdays prior to the election uh, and then the sites also look exactly the same so you're if you go somewhere and vote during the early voting period, your site and your experience is going to be exactly the same on election day. In the old model, that would it would be significantly different. You do early voting, then polling places would look very different. So it's very nice that everything is consistent. And then for election day, the formula required is one per 15. So it basically doubles the amount of sites by election day. Uh, and we did that deliberately because we weren't sure what the impact of same day registration would be on one per 15,000. Yep. So. Um, so basically doubles the number of sites. In Denver, we were legally required to have 24. We had 25. I think that that actually probably was the appropriate amount. Um, the, one, the one piece that the counties are now looking at in Colorado is during that two-week period, in particularly the first week that the sites were open, one per 30,000 is probably too much. Um, because we just don't get much traffic. The traffic starts building up kind of the second week. Uh, as we get closer to the election. So there was a lot of discussion about maybe we 
uh, up the one, you know, one to 45 or one per 50 for that first week and then one per 30 the second week. And then so you kind of phase in your sites as you get closer to election day because that's sort of when you're seeing more volume of traffic into your locations. And then we also have a requirement for 24 hour boxes and drop offs. So uh, the other thing is because so many Coloradans are actually, you know, they're not voting by mail. They're bringing their mail ballot that they received in the mail to a location. So we do have a requirement formula, and it's one per 30,000. Uh, we had well, well over that. So our requirement countywide would have been 12 24-hour boxes. Or if you don't do 24-hour box, you could do drive-ups or some other, some other mechanism. But in Denver, we actually have 24 24-hour boxes right now, and we're adding an additional six for this upcoming upcoming year so we'll end up with 30 basically 24-hour boxes across the city and they're at light rail stations and they're at transit hubs and they're at rec centers and libraries and so they're they're very very accessible and people really really like them thank you so thanks for the question um, so this particular study was all about the numbers so we weren't able to to for instance, um, conduct a survey to talk to voters or vote by mail voters. But aside from stepping away from this research, um, we do know talking to um, lots of folks across the state, and I would love to hear from Carl on this as well, um, that it seems that for the Latino community, and I'm speaking very loosely here right, because there's all, lots of differences and different experiences, but um, we hear a lot of comments that vote by mail, it is something that the Latino community shies away from, the numbers support that. Um, seems to be, a, you know, outreach is certainly an issue or a lack of awareness, um, lack of understanding the steps. There's more steps to the vote by mail process. That can be prohibitive for anybody that, any group that's not as familiar, that certainly seems to be the case for youth. You know, what are the deadlines? How do I get it in? I'm supposed to sign it, I'm supposed to, where do I drop it off? Do I mail it? That sort of thing. Um, and so not being aware of it or not being as familiar with anything time it's a little bit more complicated process that can be um, that can be something that uh, affects the likelihood that a group is going to use it and um, certainly you know some distress perhaps as well when it comes to the vote by mail process I think for some groups but on the flip side um, we're also hearing that there are lots of folks particularly down in the LA area that are doing outreach to the Latino community that are promoting vote by mail that are, you, you know, um, showing um, community members how to use it, walking them through it step by step, um, taking away the, the, the scary nature of it or the unfamiliarity and making it relevant. And when that happens, right, folks use it, Latinos use it as well. So um, I, I don't necessarily say, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, about outreach and awareness and maybe some cultural issues as well, but I don't necessarily think that it's something that can't be overcome there's many folks, many campaigns that use it and say that they are using it successfully. Um, if they make it a targeted part of their outreach and their campaign and they're actually putting resources into, into showing voters how to use it. Does that answer your question? Deanna, is there somebody back there with a the mic? I have a question about the Colorado Vote Centers. Um, I know that Colorado is no, not currently covered for any Asian languages under the federal law, but I imagine that it's covered for Spanish in some counties. Is that right? So, so, so if it is, it, it, you said it is. Yeah, there's certain jurisdictions, but Denver, we are covered under Section 203 for Spanish. So, how does that work in terms of getting language assistance to those folks? Um, is, is there actual assistance provided at the vote centers, or do people just drop off their ballots there? And if it's, it is just a drop off, where, where do they get the any assistance that they need? And um, just generally. Yeah. So the way it, well, so our ballot packets that are sent out in Denver are in both English and Spanish. So the entire packet is already. Uh, translated so when they get that they get the instructions in that way all of our voter service and polling centers have bilingual staff at them uh, so we you know try to allocate at least two sometimes three at each site uh, and then we have pretty much all of our there isn't anything that we don't have translated we have a few videos online that are sort of instruct the voter on how to do the voting process we put those on iPads at the voter ser service and polling center so in the event that someone wants to kind of watch a video on how to vote 
and how to cast their ballot, fill it out, they can do that at the site as well. So we offer a lot of variations with language assistance and we do support even though we're only required for Spanish we also have for some of the Vietnamese Russian some of those other languages we offer support from our office and we've actually um, in 2012 I think it was we did offer assistance through FaceTime uh, in Russian from from the office so we've been able to do some use some of the technology that we've put out at the sites to provide better support um, to the voters at at the locations as well Sir? Thank you. I'm Bob Johnson with the California School Employees Association. Uh, I'm particularly interested more in Colorado about the vote centers. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, what sort of hours are they open and available? And then also, was there a particular criteria on the selection of what type of facility or location they're in? For example, I know of at least one other state that, at least in, in a recent election, had early voting available in grocery stores. And I was wondering if you've experimented with something similar to that or what, what exactly is the criteria for what is a, a voting center and, and the hours? Thank you. Uh, the law does spe specify certain criteria to consider when you're doing, when you are selecting sites. And then the county clerks are also required to have a public comment process and so we had a hearing and we actually a lot we did a survey we had people vote on the types of sites that they wanted to get uh, so it's a very public process in terms of the site selection as well uh, but there's geographic considerations uh, transit access to public transit is a big one ADA accessibility obviously um, most of the sites that we had in Denver we utilized rec centers that were already managed by the city and then we also did libraries, and we had a couple private sites as well. Uh, but for the most part, we tried to utilize city existing types of facilities that people are used to going to that were um, readily available, because they also have the network connectivity already prepared, because that's one key component is since we are all on a statewide system, the network connectivity is a, is a key piece. So um, you know that varies depending on the sites that, you're, that you are going to. So the hours uh, were required under the law. Well, actually, it's under Secretary of State rule, but uh, the law specifies business hours. We're required eight hours uh, for during the week and then four hours on Saturdays. And then Election Day, of course, is 7 to 7, so it's a 12-hour day. And do any places go longer than that? You're required to do the 8 and 4. Can, can jurisdictions go longer, or is it just based on the line? Yeah, no, we can go... Um, eight to four and then you can add hours if you want to so, okay, so that's not a ceiling it's a no, floor. it's a floor okay. it's the minimum so you can go longer and then obviously if we have anybody that's there voting we wouldn't close the site we process everybody regardless of the day so. Jonathan uh, a, a question for dr. Romero um, dr. Romero from your data it appeared that among vote by mail rejections in the population at large lateness was the number one reason then a lack of a signature match, and then third was the lack of a signature at all. Mm -hmm. And yet among the non-English ballots, the vote by mail ballots, the lack of a signature was the number one reason for rejection. So what is it about, if you know, and maybe uh, Dean, Hollywood Dean Logan has some insight from his lived experience, but what is it about using the vote by mail ballot uh, that's not in English that creates that problem that we're not seeing for English users? Well, I think it's, Again, you, you may not have many on the ground experiences, but um, so you're asking why is the non-signature an issue for non-English ballots? Yeah, um, I, we can speculate many different things. I've heard many different explanations around this. I think the most obvious is that um, if there's a, a language barrier, um, that hopefully you're well, it's a non-English ballot, but um, translation issues with the quality of the of the translation on the ballot could potentially be, be something. Um, signing something feels very, um, I think, scary sometimes to other types of groups, right, that are not as familiar with the process. Just lack of awareness. It's no signature is something that, you know, we know that um, many of us have tr issues with, but potentially the non-English community seems to be having a bit more of that. Um, but I'm, I'm getting into speculation without having some data. Do you know? 
Yeah, yeah, I, th I would agree with Minty. I think the I think it, it's all speculative. I think a part of it is just a lack of familiarity with the, with the process and and probably uh, the the instructions how they're presented, and that's that varies all over the state whether they're presented in a bilingual format or or they're requested as a as a single language uh, packet. Uh, I think there may be some in some uh, communities there may be hesitancy about. Um, publicly displaying their signature in, in a way that, that would be disclosable. Um, but again, that's all anecdotal uh, from my part. I, I will take the opportunity, though, on this subject to say to, then this is an issue I, I like to bring up pretty regularly that I think fits with this concept of looking at the future of California elections, and that is that, that I think the, the dependency, and I think I saw this in, in Mindy's data, the dependency on signatures and signature matching as the sole way to validate um, voters is, is a risk that, that, um, that we've waited too long to address. I think we're going to start to see, on one hand, we're, we're advocating and pushing for more vote by mail. On the other hand, we're seeing a de deterioration of signatures and a higher percentage of signature match. So if we're not careful, that, that becomes a form of disenfranchisement. Um, and, and I think we're starting to see the signs of that now. So I think we need to be looking at um, alternative ways to, to authenticate uh, voters be, beyond simply signature matches. Particularly, and this point was made yesterday with the reliance of, on DMV signatures. Yep. as well I mean concerned and and I'm also concerned about how that there might be disparate impacts in terms of um, I, you know, groups demographically as well on that yeah. did you have something I see I'm, now I'm hogging it I know seriously Mindy um, well I I don't have an answer either so you get here's your third non-answer um, but to speculate <laughs> one thing we found is that Latino immigrant voters are old not not super old, but they're a lot older because of the fabulous job we've not done at doing anything about immigration reform, which I know is a different conference. But um, when, when you see the, the signature issue is that, and I don't know this about this with, with API voters, but I, I do know at least anecdotally that immigrant Latino voters tend to be older and that, that could be a contributing factor. That's what I would suspect. I also didn't get a chance to say earlier in terms of accessibility and vote centers, I just am wondering, can we make it a rule if we really want Latinos and young people to vote to just not have poll locations at funeral homes and at police stations? It super creeps people out. I was raised Catholic. A lot of Latinos are Catholic, and I can tell you, I talked to at least three neighbors of mine who didn't vote that election when they had us go to a funeral home. Just a thing. Please. <laughs> Ryan? Those are scary places. And, and, I ha and I have, we have tracked a little bit of the data as it relates to missing signatures or signature discrepancies. An envelope design is the biggest component as to why somebody either doesn't sign it or the signatures don't match. Um, and so I would actually, so I'm trying to give a, an answer as to how to address the problem. Um, but we have experimented us various ways in Denver and we actually made a significant envelope design change prior to the 2014 primary and then that was in place for the 2014 general. And we saw a significant reduction in the number of ballots that were not signed and also the number of discrepancies. So we were able to eliminate a lot of those household swaps as we call them, husband and wife switching their envelopes, things like that simply by printing, so on our insertion, we were printing the voter's name right above where they sign, um, and, and then it had obviously the, the signature box, and there's debate on whether or not it should be an arrow or an X, or you know what people would actually sign to. Um, but we did do an a envelope design change, and it significantly improved. So I think that's probably the biggest way to improve that particular statistic, by making those simple changes. And I will say, speaking as an election geek, the notion that you would open envelopes with lasers just makes me happy beyond description. <laughs> so, um, Ted Jackson with CFILC and the Disability Organizing Network. I, this question's a little bit of a shot in the dark, but um, the the idea that around signatures and and disqualified um, mail ballot has been um, coming up for us um, quite a bit, uh, uh, especially with folks who are blind and um, folks who um, have you know, a disability like cerebral palsy, where their signature is not going to look the same day to day. And so have you all done any thinking around um, the disqualification process and how, how you address that issue? And do you have any idea, or have you done any thinking about 
uh, how you would find out or do some research on how many of those disqualified ballots recently have been from um, voters who just had, you know, a barrier with their signature. So a, co a couple things that that we've done, um, including the envelope or the sort of redesign, but the other piece, because it is a statewide voter registration system, the counties, uh, county administrators have the ability to add in notes. So like if we do know that there's been, you know, maybe a voter has had a few signature discrepancies, they've returned a letter to us saying, oh, my signature changes, or they've given us some sort of documentation. We have a few blind voters that have told us this very thing that it's difficult for them to do. Uh, a lot of them ultimately come into the Voter Service and Polling Center and vote in person and use one of the accessible devices. But in the event that they haven't or they've had like signature changes over time, we do have an ability to document that. And so we'll do that and then the next time around or what have you, we have that information up front so that we know, you know that, that there's additional information on file and we potentially then do not reject that. Yeah, and I, w I would say similarly in California, our systems have the ability to track that as well. California law uh, does allow a, c a couple of options on that. It does allow for a voter to make a mark and have that witnessed um, as an alternative to, to a signature match. Um, and, and that information is provided in the, in the, the vote by mail packets. Uh, additionally, most counties, and I know there's discussion right now, um, legislative discussion, most counties do follow up with voters who have a mismatched signature. And the law was changed, uh, Jan, I want to say a year or two ago, to allow you to maintain multiple images of the signature. So if we get a signature on an updated voter registration form or another document, we can keep a, a series of signatures to look at um, for comparison purposes. That helps a little bit. Uh, I, again, I think this is a huge issue. I mean, in Los Angeles County, the two fastest growing populations are people between the ages of 18 and 25 and people over the age of 65. And the signature, for, for different reasons, the signature quality in those two demographics um, is increasingly getting poor. And, it's gonna, and that's going to become a, a bigger issue as we, as we go forward. So there's lots of little uh, stop gaps that we can do, which I think is what you're hearing from us um, now. Uh, but I think ultimately we have to have an alternative to the signature. I can just add something really quickly there, too. Um, so in terms of what counties are doing, so we did, um, most of our research on this particular project was quantitative, right? But we did do a survey with all the county election offices, including deans. Um, and um, one of the bits of information that we were asking about was what do counties do when there is a signature issue? Um, actually, period, um, but particularly when there's a signature issue, do they contact the voter? Um, and nearly all counties do at attempt to contact the voter. It's their policy, mostly by mail, also by, um, by postcard or by email if they have that. Um, but while that's the policy of most counties, most counties also told us that in the end, they op often don't get a hold of the voter, and that can be because um, uh, inaccurate, uh, just can't, somebody doesn't, they don't, after a few t attempt or whatever, somebody doesn't pick up a phone or they don't mail back something, or al also because um, records, um, phone records and email records are not required to be kept by counties and, and, um, and they terribly go out of date, right? Or at least certainly emails. Um, so, so one of our recommendations, and this is our issue brief too, um, uh, talking about county processing and variation, was to have to require all counties, sorry for all of those of you that are registrars in the office, um, in, the, in the room, but to require that contact with the voter in some <coughs> form. Um, and that could be worked out, right, legislatively, um, what exactly that would look like. But if your ballot doesn't get, if, if it's getting rejected because of a signature issue, that you get notified before the election and hopefully have a chance to come in and correct that. Um, and after the election that you get notified if your ballot was rejected. Now, voters um, do have the ability to call or look up online if their ballot was rejected, but um, that puts the responsibility on the voter, and many voters don't even know that's an option. Um, and then we have online tools, but we hope this will change, but currently online tools, most of them across the state, when we surveyed them at least at that time, um, didn't give ballot rejection information. Just r most of them just gave information whether it was actually received or not, and some gave information on whether it was counted or not, if that makes sense. So notifying, in other words, notifying the voter, we think is a really important thing, um, and more can be done there. And of course, resources, it takes resources, because election offices, that would be a, a burden in terms of um, time and staff, but we think it's important. 
in, in Colorado, legally, we're required to notify the voter, and there's a few different ways that can happen. So we, in Denver, we have ballot trace, so if a voter signed up to get those automatic notifications, they get a text literally the minute that we scan the ballot as a missing signature, they get a text immediately saying that there's a cure process. So a lot of them will come in right away and take care of that. Same with signature discrepancies, same with undeliverable ballots. So our ballot proactive ballot tracking system actually pushes that notification out to the voter. The voter doesn't have to do anything to contact us. And then we also then send a letter with a prepaid postage envelope and they can, re they can respond with the affidavit completed for the missing signature or the signature discrepancy and they have up until eight days post-election day to do that. So it goes along with kind of the UACAVA cure uh, deadline as well. So we have this, sort of this eight day cure period post-election. So we've had a very high rate of those types of issues getting resolved either prior to election day or right after election day. And we only got about two minutes left. So, Ryan, brevity is the very soul of wit. <laughs> well, I have a two-part question, both for uh, Amber in regards to voter service and polling centers. Um, it should be quick, though. Um, I think I heard you state that most voters who come into the voter service and polling center uh, bring in their ballot with them. Number one, is that a requirement? Do they have to surrender it? If not, um, what steps are taken there? And then secondarily is if a voter comes in with their ballot, um, and votes on election day or in early voting um, period, are they turning it in in the envelope for the signature still to be verified or do you update the e-poll book immediately and allow them to cast the ballot right then and there? So the, the voters that bring their voted ballot in, they can drop it in a drop box outside the, the site or what have you. That's usually where we were seeing them. They weren't actually walking inside to a site. They were using the 24-hour boxes. Uh, so they can drop that off. If they want to vote in person at any of the voter service and polling centers, they don't have to have the physical mail ballot to do it. Um, so we will issue them voter credit right there. They can vote on one of the DREs or they can vote a paper ballot. Either either option is available. Uh, and then we record that, that um, vote credit immediately in the statewide system. So then in the event that their mail ballot does come back or maybe they had mailed it and they weren't sure if we were going to get it, we will see then the in-person vote credit issued first and then the mail ballot would not be accepted. So great, so uh, just as a quick wrap up, um, you know, we talk a lot about how these changes might affect the ability of individuals to participate. But if I can take turnout off the table, because that's something I think folks are, fo um, just really quick, what's another potential benefit of moving to some of these newer options for voting, um, either in California or in other states, you know, if, if what, what besides turnout is another good reason to do this? Why should we care? Well, I think from my perspective, it's, it's just being responsive to the, the people that we serve. I, I think we're hearing loud and clear that, that voters want an experience that's meaningful, it's intuitive, and that, that, that fits with the way in which they, they interact with, with other activities. And uh, to, to quote one of my students last night, the, the current process, um, and as somebody who does this on a more than full-time basis, it's hard to hear this, but, but it's also understandable. I mean, they describe the current process as, as cold, old, and impersonal. Um, and and that's, not, that's really not the image that we want for, for voting. We want it to be an interactive um, experience and that's, that's meaningful not only for the individual voter, but, but meaningful for the whole electorate. And, and I think um, we have an obligation to respond to that. Amber? Uh, our, our philosophy in Denver and prior to the, the election reform and sort of through the election reform process has been voter first and voter experience and we sort of start there and figure out what is it that we want that to look like and then build back from there and that was really the policy innovation that happened. It's absolutely a policy innovation. You know, we got creative, we changed that precinct residency deadline, got same day, ballot delivery, all those things, and it has significantly improved the voter's experience. And uh, Pew's d done some research and they did some surveying of, of voters themselves and sort of how how the new model uh, worked and that report will come out, you know, later, but it but so far, I mean, it's it's very, very positive um, feedback as to how that, how that worked. So, I mean, our, our goal, we 
continue to focus on what that experience looks like and how we can make it better. I don't think there's ever a point where we'll say, you know, we're right where we need to be. There's nothing else we can do. I mean, I think we can always, always make things better. Um, and some of the apps that we've done that with, the digital petition application is w another example of, of the experience of ballot access and petition circulation being improved, not only for voters, but on the operational side of things as well. Because the other piece in Colorado, we've done this and we've, we've made the voters' experience better in many ways, and we have more voters voting, but we've reduced costs, which is significant for uh, jurisdictions, taxpayers that have, you know, been facing budget issues for many years. Um, so you can have it all, I, I, and I think we're a good example of, of all of it, you know, sort of wrapped into one. Well, I'll just echo what Amber and Dean said in terms of the voter experience, but, you know, essentially, for me, it's every vote counts, right, um, period. Oh, thank you. But every vote does count. I mean, you can do all kinds of calculations and wondering if, if a given reform or this reform or that reform, how much it's going to impact turnout by half a percent or two percent or whatever. Well, especially in the state of California, that's a whole heck of a lot of folks. And even if it wasn't a whole heck of a lot of folks, a very key you know, cornerstone of our democracy is, uh, is lifting up and ensuring the rights of the minority to be heard. So, and particularly since we know that low turnout or having fewer options can disproportionately impact underrepresented groups, we need to always have that in mind, right? Um, but aside from that, aside from turnout, and um, I also think it says something about um, when you look around and the voter or the potential voter or the young person coming into the system sees a system that is open and responsive and trying to provide lots of options and is contacting and connecting and informing and being transparent and all those sorts of things. Um, I think that says something to individuals about um, how much we value, we've talked about valuing the vote, valuing the vote right? Um, how much we value the vote and how much we value them participating. And right now we hear from a whole heck of a lot of folks, right, that say that across groups, you know, that they don't feel like their vote matters and that the system doesn't give a darn. Um, when you see the system being so responsive and so open, I think that says something um, and tells folks that, you know, we've got, it matters and it matters to, to everyone. So that's something to say. Take us out, Carla. Take us out. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> Carla, the closer. Well, I mean, fundamentally, this is California. Like, we have Silicon Valley and Hollywood, Dean Logan. I mean, <laughs> Um, we, we could be making voting the like coolest, funnest, most innovative, awesome process if we really, really tried, if we made it super de duper important. Um, I mean, why, why it matters is that for us, it matters because it does increase turnout. That, that I just can't take it off the table. I mean, in, if we change the turnout, if we change who's making decisions on election day, we change the future of the state. And we change the type of people that are running the state. We change the type of policies that get through Sacramento. Um, but I mean, this is California. We can su totally bring the awesomeness to this. And, and the stuff that's happening in Colorado is so cool. It's so cool. It's so fantasy of the world in my head cool. that I think we could totally do it. I mean, like I said, we've, we've got so much talent and so much movement infrastructure here in California. Um, I, I think we could make this happen. We can have, and, and the thing is that we, we have to set it up for success by including really awesome outreach as part of it. We can set up a better system. We can have better voter information. We've got to get it into people's hands in a much more effective, large-scale way. Thank you very much. Well, I know we ended up running a little long, um, but it's like trying to squeeze eight pounds of awesome into a five-pound bag. Um, so I, I appreciate your, um, your patience.